you know, you want to be simple enough, um, but you don't want to be too simple, you know what I mean? And so you have to kind of tread, tread lightly right there. Um, I, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if there is a, there, there is no formula and there is no secret sauce, man. It's, it's just constant uh, trial and error and, and, and trusting your ear, you know what I mean? On, on what sounds good to you. You need the Kellervision app. 24 7 mini documentaries, podcasts, live shows, DJ live streams, top five, subscription packages, plus products for all your podcasts and street culture sports. Download it from the App Store for free today. Beatbox created. And we need to talk about world music and street culture. Killer Keller podcast. Ready. Ladies and gentlemen, Killer Keller podcast, live and direct central London, or as central as you need to be, could be, wanna be, should be, you don't want to be anywhere else. Big shout out to graffitikings.co.uk. Um, as you can probably tell, judging by my uh, sonic vocals, we're going across Atlantic to San Francisco, West Coast area for one of the heroes in uh, turntablism and Scratch DJ, Invisible Scratch Bickles, D-Styles inside the place. How are you, legend? <laughs> hey, what's up, what's up? How you doing, killer? <laughs> I'm good, family. How are you? I'm good. Actually, I'm in Las Vegas now, but I grew up in, in San Francisco. Uh, the Bay Area is like where I grew up. But yeah, I, I currently reside in Las Vegas right now. Talk to me about that. What's the deal with uh, with Vegas? <sighs> um, You know, it was it's uh, one of the last places where you can actually afford to buy a house you know what i mean because the west coast is so so damn expensive california in general is so damn expensive you know mm. san francisco los angeles it's just it's just crazy you you basically need a million dollars to buy a house you know? yeah so, i feel yeah. that that sounds yeah, like that, that sounds like the rest of the world right now <laughs> pretty much yeah before we carry on can you hear me when i whisper yeah, yep. that's perfect. Then I'm using this microphone. I always like to check. Um, yeah, it, it's very much like that in London. There's a lot of things going on in the world right now that um, suggests that uh, us, us creative people, or at least people within the industry that we orbit around, um, we have to we have to find our natural um, habitats elsewhere. It can't. Right. We make the place look cool, and then uh, and then we get chucked out the place that we made cool. <laughs> Jesus, right? <laughs> oh, man. Talk to me about um, San Francisco anyway, because, you know, you spent a hell of a lot of time there and at a time where New York was very much dominant. It was very much the the, the, the place, you know, young D Styles to, to, to have garnered a mass of such incredible skills and abilities. That must have been a, a, not so much of a homegrown thing, more of a study. Um, yeah, so I grew up in about 40 minutes outside of San Francisco in a small city called San Jose. Uh, and, and now San Jose is kind of known as uh, Silicon Valley. It's like where all the tech companies are, are based at. Um, right. so, uh, you know, growing up there, um, you know, like I had to take the train or, you know, drive out to San Francisco just to kind of be around the city and the, the culture. And most of the, the, the events were in San Francisco, you know, uh, if you wanted to go watch, um, you know, Big Daddy Kane, or if someone came into town, NWA, you know, they were usually performing in San Francisco. So yeah. that's where the, the hub of the culture was. Um, and so me and my friends would go out there and just, you know, go out to the shows and, and I'd try to absorb everything. Um, but I was I was lucky to um, to be around that and be around hip hop in the 80s, you know what I mean? Um, you know, just studying, you know, the, the, the B-boys, studying the, the DJs, um, all the graffiti, all that stuff. Um, mm. And back then, you know, this was like 84, 85. I, I tried it all. I tried to rap. I tried to, I tried to break. Um, I was doing graffiti. And for some reason, just DJing stuck with me. You know what I mean? Scratching um, in general felt natural. And I felt like I could, exp I could express myself best through that. And so I, I just stuck with it. You know what I mean? And, um, and I was just, grateful and, and uh, fortunate to be around, um, you know, the older guys who pretty much paved the way and, and showed me the way, you know what I mean? Who were the, who were the inspiration? Who were the people that paved the way and showed you the way of the time? Um, so in, in my hometown in San Jose, um, there was one guy, um, 
Peanut Butter Wolf. And um, yeah, he, he's, he's a few years older than me. Uh, I went to school um, with his um, his sister. And so just kind of being around uh, around um, them, uh, his family, and, and just seeing kind of uh, what he was doing. He was, he was DJing, he was working back then with uh, Charisma and other MCs uh, and just scratching, you know what I mean? Um, so whenever I got a chance to see him DJ out live, I would definitely go. Um, and I was I was underage back then, so I'd have to sneak into the events. Uh, he was he was one definitely that inspired me. Um, King Tech uh, from oh, the nice. Sway and Tech Wake Up Show. He's another one, another legend. Um, and he's from also the the South Bay um, mm. where I grew up. And then of course Qbert, Mixmaster, Mike Apollo, those guys. Just. Well, Crazy, crazy lineage. I say that word quite a lot, but I, this the only way to describe it is like to have to have these people who weren't so widely known, but mm-hmm. in the in the paddock with that must have been one hell of a. You sometimes you can just um, it, you you naturally collect creative energy without even knowing how rare it is. And when you're with these kind of people that are like orbiting around the same area as you, it must have been a given. Like, yo, of course, Peanut Butter Wolf. You know what I mean? Right, right. Yeah. I mean, you know, he was definitely the the hometown hero. And, um, you know, coming from where we grew up, um, just looking up to him and seeing him take these steps and, you know, and he created Stone's Throw and then he moved to LA and, you know, and so it was very inspiring uh, to see that, to see someone from our own hometown make it and be successful, you know, very inspiring. How much of that, D-Man, how much of that is, how much of that is creative energy and how much of that is timing? Because if I remember that era and discovering you guys, it was really like a very special moment. Yeah, I, I, I'd, I'd probably say it's 50-50 because at that time, you know, that was before the explosion of the internet um, and you really had to go out and dig and 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 find stuff. And so, you know, back then, um, timing was was everything, you know what I mean? Um, and um, yeah, it was just a great time to to be active and to, to be putting out music back then, you know what I mean? Yeah, it was a golden era and... Um... Talk to me about talk to me about um, where, because obviously, as, as mentioned, although there were a lot of influences around you, the turntableism, or what it came to become, was still very fresh, wasn't it? Definitely was. Definitely was. Um, like, you know, I, I would say, um, whew. You know, we were getting a lot of our influence from from watching old DMC videotapes back then, um, mm-hmm. and and it was almost like, you know, it was it was hard to to find these these videotapes because we, you know they, they weren't selling them at your local store, right? Mm-hmm. You had to get a you had to get a copy of a copy of a copy from someone, and um, it's just funny because back then the guy who used to sell these videotapes uh, was was Cubert, so you would he was the he was the plug for trying to get these these um, amazing <laughs> these dmc battles right you know you, you would you would and back then it was that was like the era of of the the pager or the the beeper so you would you would page q and uh, you'd you'd like specify like a time to come come by his place meet him give him five bucks he would give you the tape <laughs> you'd go home and study these videotapes so he was the plug um and uh yeah it was just crazy man because that's how we learned you know what i mean we learned from watching videotapes for winding it 100 times trying to copy what these guys were doing um and you know and and these these dmc um battles these were the olympics you know what i mean yeah. every country ha- had somebody and and so it was just interesting and dope to see how uh someone from greece or japan you know or or um the netherlands they would use their own um their own flavor and their own style from their from where they came from and put it into their 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 DJing style or their, their cutting or their, their beat juggling, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I do. I, I mean, it, it that sounds just so given that the Q was the hookup, he was the plug. But that just he seems, yeah, 
Like, how did how did that even come about? Like, how did how did you know that he was the guy to go and see? Uh, I mean, because you know, as far as the whole DJ battle uh, scene, you know that that's a very small scene. It's very niche. Um, if if you go to a couple battles, you kind of meet everyone, all the key players, and mm. you know, in the scene, especially in the San Francisco um, Bay Area. So, you know, like once you kind of <clears throat> um, meet someone, you know, then that just kind of you just kind of uh, connect the dots, and er, you know, everyone will just say, "Hey, where do you where do you get that uh, that that one ninety three you know DMC uh, battle?" Mm. I'll just tell you, oh, you, you got to get it from Q. Just just um, connect with Q, and he'll he'll get you, you know, the drugs. Basically, <laughs> that's what it was. <laughs> drugs, it is, man. Like the thing is with hip hop disciplines, and this is something that has become ever more infectious as I've grown up further. When I've as I've got older, the the the, the tools. It's almost like you. It's it's the. I'm growing up to be a DJ or a beatboxer or an artist, and I want to be able to create sustainability. But once you hit that peak, you realize actually that you're just kind of addicted to the hip hop tools and you just can't help. But I don't even care about the money because I just got to get this right. (laughs) Yeah, 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 yeah. What is that thing? What is that thing? You know, I don't know. Part of it, I like, I, I like to compare it to uh, the rush and the high you get from um, graffiti, from bombing. I, I don't know if you've, <laughs> you know, just going out on the on the highway or the freeway and, and just bombing uh-huh. and get getting that that crazy rush, knowing that you could get, you know, arrested, um, busted, killed, whatever. Yeah. And then and then seeing your piece the next day, you know what I mean? It just there's there's something great about it, and and um, and I, I think that's the same for for every element of, of hip hop. You know, if it's DJing, mm. if you're putting out mixtapes back in the day or records, you know, you're just kind of cementing your 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 sort of your your stamp, your tag, or your legacy mm. that way. You know what I mean? It's like a high that you always chase. You know what I mean? It is like a high that you always chase. It's a co- I guess it's a combination of ego meets. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> meets nothing. It's just you. It's just ego. <laughs> It's just pure ego, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's just mad, mad drive. I mean, I think, you know, when you when you look at these disciplines as a whole, and we're talking, I guess we're talking more in retrospect, if you've got a creative energy and a talent, or at least you think you can, tri- can contribute at a point in a culture, the first thing you've got to think of is you better come good. Because there's already a stable full of people that are doing anything. Yeah. I think with with turntablism or scratch DJing, there was this, there was this ceiling that had been set respectfully within the early '90s. A lot of heroes were were were, were forged in that time, right. but there was just something about the Bay Area DJs that when they got on board with it it became just like a whole nother thing. Mm. Mm. I think, I mean, a lot of that, you know, I think just being from the West Coast, we were influenced by New York, of course. And we also had our own Bay Area roots, you know what I mean, with with San Francisco and Oakland, the music scene there. Uh, And then we were influenced by like Miami, like, just the whole Miami based thing. Mm-hmm. So we embraced we embraced it all. And I felt like we just kind of took it and made it our own little thing. You know what I mean? We didn't care. Cause I, you know, back then I felt like New York, uh, they didn't really mess with with upper tempos with like faster, like 115, 120, 130 BPM type beats. Mm-hmm. Um and Miami was all about that. And all the DJs were cutting over fast stuff. Um and so I feel like we embraced it. We embraced New York and we took what, what we liked about that. We took what we liked about Miami and we combined it and kind of made it our own, our own style. Um, and I mean, this goes back to like, you know, Mixmaster Mike and, and Cuber and DJ Apollo. Like, in my opinion, they laid the, the blueprint for like turntable music and turnta- just the whole turntable band orchestra 
style. You know what I mean? That was, in my opinion, that was the blueprint. What they were doing, and what they were doing, I, I know a lot of people don't even know they were doing. Um, it was a uh, FM two O, Fierce Minds to Observe. That was that was the rap group. <laughs> it was, it was them on the turntables, and they wow. had they had two or three MCs, and they were like Public Enemy, but with live, um, you know, scratching and DJing behind them. You know what I mean? Wow, that was way ahead of its time, wasn't it? When you think about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. It's probably out there. Um, do you, your contribution to turntabling, turntablism, scratch DJing, uh, the 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 expressiveness in which you cut, the expressiveness in which you like, it just feels to me that turntables was just the the thing, but you could probably have lent your creative hand to anything and it I don't know you know there's some people that you just hear and you're just like wow you just you're you're singing through that thing you're 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 moving through that thing you're expressing through that thing that and I find that really interesting like how you even got to that point with such um, tenacity and confidence to express yourself in that way man yeah I you know, like I think with any like instrument or any art, you have to say something. And and especially in hip hop, you know, we have that that golden rule of no biting, you know, mm-hmm. number one. And and so for the longest time, like I didn't I was such a, a bedroom DJ and a bedroom scratcher that I, I didn't want to go on stage and and go in front of the public eye until I felt like I was original enough. And I had mm-hmm. something to, to, to contribute. Right. Um, mm-hmm. And so I started battling around. Um, 88, 89. And, and uh, when I, when I saw myself on video, I realized I'm not original. And I was, I was just a biter and I sound like my influences. I, I, I can hear Qbert. I can hear a mixed master mic in, in my style. And so I got disgusted with myself and I figured I need to go back to the drawing board. And, um, you know, I, I stayed away from the scene from, uh, I don't know, 90, 94, 93, 94 is my last battle. I stayed away from the scene until about 97. And that's when I kind of felt like I had something to offer, you know what I mean? And I, I tried to find myself, you know, and I, I finally figured out, all right, I can't chase um, Qbert. I'm not as fast and technical as him. And I can't do mix match mic because no one else can fucking sound like that guy. So I need <laughs> to be, I need, I need to be, be myself. And, um, you know, I, I took some chances, some risks and, and I figured, all right, I'm gonna go the opposite route. If if everyone's gonna be fast and, and crazy and and like hyper speed, I'm gonna go slow and I'm gonna be more funky and I'm gonna to try to say something and be more melodic. And and so I took the risk. Um and you know, like I think it, it's it's still an ongoing thing because I'm still trying to find my voice. It never ends, you know what I mean? But um I'm just lucky that um, you know, I'm I'm able to express myself through through scratching. That's some world champion business talk right there, ladies and gentlemen, without question. <laughs> like, in in this day and age with generations that have passed, I think one of the, the last thing people consider is patience. And you talk about taking risks, like when you're in, how old were you in 94? I mean, actually, let's not go there. But in 1994 <laughs> to 1997, 98, that's a, that's a wide berth of I'm studying. That... I don't know if it's just risk. I think, I think for a lot of people, anxiety mm. in those early stages of redeveloping, right? Yeah, for sure. It was a great time too because that's when um, a lot of the these legends um, today started coming out and battling. Babu, <laughs> Craze, A Track, and so you know I was around these guys, but I was always kind of in the back, just quietly studying and trying to figure out. Um, what the hell am I going to do? You know what I mean? I, and I loved what they were doing, but I can't, you know, I already knew I, I'm not going to be them. I can't, I can't do what they do. So it was a good time to be around that and to absorb it, you know what I mean? And marinate and, um, and just kind of quietly plot, like what the hell, <laughs> what, what, what my own, what my next steps were, you know? Yeah. And I think, again, going back to the right time, right place, right time thing, um, to, to be a study of that time and see these celebrities, DJ celebrities emerge, um, 
you, it almost gave you the opportunity to find your space within the the the, the, the front row of these um, these new statuses. Yes, yes, totally, totally. Yeah, um, and, and, you know, and I was I was lucky enough to be around Cubert uh, when he was recording Wave Twisters, mm. um, and to kind of see him work and see like his workflow and his creative process, um, I was able to kind of learn from that, you know, and so that inspired me to to make my own album and, and then i realized battling isn't for me i'm not gonna i'm not gonna that's not where i i shine you mm -hmm. know what i mean and i i always felt like i needed i needed more than you know three minutes or five minutes to to kind of express myself so i figured all right let me take it to uh the studio and, and just producing and recording and, and making music and um until today i i feel like that's kind of where i shine i'm more of a studio rat than i am uh, someone who on who's on stage and shines, you know what I mean? Mm, yeah, that's right. You've got to find your position, but you you really uh, spearheaded that. What? Um, because and also I might just add as well is if you're not uh, watching and you're listening behind these styles at the moment is, um, you know your archetype collection on show. I mean. We're in the hub of the studio right here, and you also you also teach as well. This is a a more current thing that you're up, up to at the moment, isn't it? Right, right, yeah. So, um, yeah, we we opened a DJ school. Um, me and the Beat Junkies. Uh, we opened a DJ school in Los Angeles, California. Um, and we um, you know, we teach everything from the foundation of DJing to trick mixing to scratching to beat juggling. Um, and so we have an actual school in LA, and then we have an online school as well. I'm very much aware of this school. Big up, big up, V Junkies. Oh, man. Thank you, man. Thank Come you. Come on, man. Um, do you do you uh, when you're um when you're teaching? How far into the recesses of your uh, your catalog do you go? Because it must be quite profound that being one of the contributors, the main contributors internationally um, of the of um, of uh, West Coast. And outwards, and um, not mention any of the, you know, the, the scratch pickles, mixtapes, or the uh, beat junkies X Y Z. I mean, the, you know, the, the battles, the, the production, the albums. You know, it must be quite hard, <laughs> hard to like, right. not to. It might be, it must be hard to defer from the fact that you, you know, you're these styles. <laughs> I mean, you know, like, I think a lot of our students are 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 drawn to to come to our school. You know what I mean? Just just for that, for the history part of it. Mm -hmm. um, but we actually try to, you know, we, we use these these lessons that we've learned um, along the way, you know, and we, we we try to teach these lessons to them as well. Just things that we've learned, the ups and downs of our, of our career. And, uh, you know, we try to let them know, hopefully, that they don't make these same mistakes that we did. You know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. But it, it, is a, it is a different day and era now with social media. And, you know, and it, it's interesting because a lot of these, um, these, these students, they ask us, how do you navigate? you know, through social media, how do you market yourself? How do you promote this? Mm. How do you put out music? And so, you know, like we're trying to keep up with technology and this, this day and era as well, man, it's, it's, it's pretty crazy. Just, you know, the, the speed of how everything is, is traveling right now. Yeah. And I, I think there's a question for each, I was, as you were talking, I was thinking, well, actually that's, that's a good point. That's a good question. Okay. Let me start, let me start from a teaching point of view, like your, mm -hmm. from a, from a more techers, to, to, to the funky side of D styles. Talk to me about the teachings of this. Like, like, and, and I don't want you to give away too much of your special sources, huh? but like, <laughs> you know, what is, what is the secret behind keeping it that funky and that expressive? What's the secret? If, 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 if a student was to ask you, what, what, what is it? Hmm. Jeez. It's the secret. I, I, by the way, I am I am a I am a conduit to DJ Prime Cuts right now. I can feel him on my shoulder. <laughs> oh shit! That's Shout your out to guy, Prime Cuts, man. Big up Prime Cuts. Yeah, yeah. I love Prime Cuts, man. Yeah, um, man. he loves you. <laughs> um, man. I mean, secrets. That, you know, it's it's. Um, I I really feel like you have to have some some type of strong, um, foundation of. Of, of cuts, you know what I mean? And, and I understand why a lot of the the jazz players studied blues, mm -hmm. you know, because I think that I think that was their foundation. And then they took it to the next level with, with jazz. And I feel like with cutting or scratching, um, 
you know, you have to you have to know where everything came from, and so you have to study the legends that came before you. So for me, it's 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 Joe Cooley and it's Jazzy Jeff, DJ Aladdin, and and mm-hmm. um, Cash Money, and um, I feel like they are 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 blues, are BB King, Muddy Waters, and to me, they are the epitome of of funk. Mm-hmm. Um, and so what I'm I'm doing is I'm taking what I learned from them, their style, and I'm not trying to copy it, but I'm I'm trying to turn it into my own version of it. You know what I mean? And I'm trying to to sort of channel their 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 energy and, and put it into my style. Um, but it's such a, a thin line because you you know you want to be simple enough, um, but you don't want to be too simple. You know what I mean? And so you have to kind of tread tread lightly right there. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if there is a there. There is no formula, and there is no secret sauce, man. It's it's just constant uh, trial and error, and 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 trusting your ear. You know what I mean on on what sounds good to you. You know what I mean, man. And especially with the way technology is right now, it's like you can't bypass that that blueprint, that DNA that. Has, like you say, the muddy waters effect where um, the BB Kings, like these are, they are our equivalents right now, the Jazzy Jeffs and the. Yeah. You, but, yeah, definitely. You can't, you can't escape that. That has, that's like your foundations. Mm-hmm. 100%. 100%. But do you feel like, um, do you feel like with the awakening of technology and the, overflow of of djs and talent and focus do you feel like you mean you've got to put three to four times more attention on individuality within the scratches or the cuts or the decisions you make right because everything is hyper observed right yeah yeah i mean yeah it's it's um it's real tricky these days, you know what I mean? Cause there's so much out there. There's so much <clears throat> information, you know what I mean? There's so many people are constantly feeding you videos and this and that. And it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's so easily to, to get drawn into something and, and, and be influenced, you know what I mean? By something. Um, I, I just think at the end of the day though, you know, it, it really comes down to, to just trusting your ears mm-hmm. and, and, and just kind of knowing, yeah, man, this, this, this feels right. This, it, and this sounds right. And this is, this is me. You know what I mean? I'm not, I'm not trying to, to be, you know, craze, you know, or I'm not trying to be this. It's okay to have, to have that influence mm. and, and, and take that influence. But, you know, uh, I think Carlos Santana said it better, uh, said it best. He said, it's like, you have influences, but at, 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 at a certain point, it's like a snake and you need to shed that skin mm. and peel it and peel it off. You know what I mean? So I, I I like that right there. <laughs> yeah, I love that. I love that. Elton John. I, I I always I always think of the one Elton John said was like you can have as many different influences and ideas and um you just got to put them in a box and and then one day you might think of an idea again and go back to that box and just go yeah that that's where I got it from I won't do that or I will do that it's about having it in your armory though. Right, right. What? Well, yeah, totally, totally. And it, it's crazy because you know, with the whole hip hop thing and no biting. I think now that I'm older, you know, it's I learned from from copying, from from imitating back then. You know mm. what I mean? And and now I realize it it was okay to borrow that, but I'm not going to go out and publicly <laughs> do you know Rob Swift style or or someone's routine, you know, to the T. Like, but yeah. I learned I learned the blueprint. Um, the the I learned the technical part of it by by copying his routine, you know what I mean? But I'm going to take that and I'm going to create and, and make my own, you know what I mean? That's Everyone the hardest has their own, bit. their own fingerprint. Yeah, oh, that's the hardest. Yeah, for sure. That's the hardest. Yeah. It's like when you're a, a graph writer, you get given sketches by people and you get really comfortable with those sketches and, and how do you morph into something else? And, and 
And it's the same with Razel with beatboxing. Like again, like beatboxing took a four wheel drive the same time as turntablism did. And I would ima- I would argue that maybe supernatural kind of came through with the MCing and the battle rapping that kind of sp- spawned an attention to battle rap and the likes of Eminem of his time. Um, right. It's so hard not to be influenced by uh, people when they're doing so well. <laughs> right, for sure. I know, right? It's almost like the, the codes you've been given that are just like suddenly there and you're like, well, I, c- I can do this, but how do I change that and make it something else? It's tough, isn't it? Right. It is very tough, yeah. No, that's perfectly what you, that's perfect what you said. So like with the graph, like I know a lot of like writers will will share alphabets, you know what I mean? And block letters and, and this and that. And it's, it's, it's easy to, to copy it, you know what I mean? Um, mm. but, then, but then how do you make it your own? And that's the whole... That is the challenge right there. Yeah, it's the challenge because everyone says, oh, yeah, but that's you. But it's like, well, yeah, but I, you know, Slash sounds like Slash. I I, I would imagine he has to by now know what Slash sounds like. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> but how do you know? <laughs> how do you know? I know, I know, right? You know what? I, I want to kind of, sorry, I want to go go back and, and shout out Prime Cuts. Um, just because I feel like when the Scratch Perverts came into the scene, they it was a huge disrupt. And, and by that, I mean, there was, there was, there wasn't any characters quite like prime cuts and Tony Vegas at the time. Um, mm. and I felt like if you want to compare it to wrestling, I felt like those guys were like the bad guys who came in and started talking, sh- talking trash. Uh, and they were hyping up their battles. Like, cause before that there, there wasn't a lot of hype like that. And I remember when like Tony Vegas uh, first came to San Francisco and he, he was um, scheduled to battle Babu in the, the scratch uh, category, mm-hmm. and uh, and there was so much hype around it because he was he was online talking, saying he was gonna um, you know fuck up Babu and he was gonna take scratching and take it back to to the UK and we were like what the fuck who's this guy he has the balls to say this you know <laughs> but 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 now I look back and it's like he was so ahead of his time he was just hyping up um, you know the the fight or the battle it's almost like a UFC fighter a boxer. You know, being able to hype up their their battle and and, uh, and he can back it up, of course, too. You know, but I, I just remember like when they when the scratch perverts came into the scene, it was just it was like something I had never seen before. Like mm-hmm. <laughs> it was like uh, yeah, it was crazy. Man. Anyways, yeah, shout out to my guy Prime Cook. Yeah, yeah, they took no prisoners. In fact, I, 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 they, they didn't even take their own crew's prisoners. Like I know, Mister Thing and First Rate were just complete. They were like the rest of the DJ scene. They were just like kind of no, we're right. we're still here learning. But like our guys right. here, are just like fucking having it with everybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They were, they they would come out smashing people with chairs, man. That's that's how crazy I remember the perverts. <laughs> And that's a really good description as of its time. Um, I think there's only one or two times in in a in a uh, cycle of of a culture where you really get those WWF moments where it's like you really have personalities. Right, right, right. I think we need more of that in, in this day. You know what I mean? There's, I think, um, you know, it just seems like you know everyone's very. <laughs> Very, very PC and, and, and cordial, but it, it's nice to have these guys who have zero filter and just say whatever they want. You know what I mean? Mm. Did it get to the point, D, did it get to the point where, because you were there throughout this whole time and um, everything, it did for me anyway, you know, I think it's once Craze had won so many DMCs, world finals, and and there was every kind of scratch team battle you could possibly have within the restrictions of the tech um all the rules of tech Mm -hmm. it just felt like it had got bloated and there was this so it was so it was such a successful scene and commercialized like from a uk point of view you know tony and joel were on the front cover of like men's magazines you know it's it got to this it got to this point where you you could you know scratch t- scratch DJing was on TV commercials. Did you did you ever feel like, oh man, this it's not entirely what I bought into. Mm, right. I mean, you know, like I I really um congratulate um you know that 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 actually happened. You know, like uh, Rob Swift and Shortcut, they were on a a Gap commercial. You know what I mean? And yeah. I never thought I, I'd ever see that. You know, but I guess you know that's that's just kind of um. 
the direction things things head in. Um, mm. But it, it doesn't it doesn't really um, distract me from from my goals and my focus. You know what I mean? And I'm I'm still I'm I'm th- that's not my goal. Like to to be in a commercial or nothing. Um, mm. I'm not mad at that, you know what I mean, and, and I totally understand it. But you know, like as long as you, you're still focused on what you were put on earth to do, you know what I mean. And, and look at Shortcut and, and Rob; they're still at it, and they're still killing it. You know what I mean. Mm. So, um, yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't think it should distract anything. No, that's right. I think there is an argument that well, if these heroes that richly deserve it don't do it, some other person may that don't quite nearly have the kudos and the te- technical ability uh right so you got to go with it you you know what i mean if if an opportunity knocks you got to go and take it haven't you right right For and sure. do you think that do you think that falls in line with some of the uh practice that you teach at the school because that was kind of coming on to my next question is like do they do they often ask like what the career path is like as a as a upcoming DJ, because I would imagine in 2022, the relevance of DJing is fundamentally different compared to what it was in 2002. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, um, you know, our, our students are very broad. Uh, and, um, for me, I primarily just teach advanced scratching. Like I'm just focusing on that. Mm -hmm. So the bulk of my, the bulk of my students, um, are, interested in, in either battling or making turntable music and trying to make that a career as opposed to someone who, um, you know, like, like our, our other instructors, Rhett Matic, um, or like Mr. Chalk, they're teaching more foundation uh, DJing. And so the book, the majority of the students are, are just learning mixing and, and how to make a career out of, you know, either DJing in clubs or, or bars or restaurants or whatever. So, you know what I mean? It's, it's two different, it's apples and oranges. Mm. Um, and um, yeah, for my students, um, it, you know, it's, it, it's awesome to be able to, to teach and, and show them and, and have people that are actually eager to, to listen to what, what the hell I have to say, <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and teach. Um, and I would have never have thought that um, I'd, I'd be teaching, scratching, you know what I mean? Um, to the world, man, it's just crazy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's it's very telling of the time we're in, isn't it? Right. Um, and social media, again, it, you alluded to it earlier the it's the it's the new it's a new thing. And when lockdown kicked in, everyone went straight to Twitch. The uh, the right. response from the public was amazing. Uh, people got quickly assimilated with the idea that that this is the way we're going to be doing it. And even when things open up again, this is a new stable for where people can find out about new tunes. DJs weren't actually playing songs that they didn't want to play. They played things they wanted to play and that. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. And that's why I'm so shocked when I, when I tune in on Twitch and I'm watching DJs and they're just playing the same club set that they would play. <laughs> Any like, come on, man. Like take, you know, like take, take a chance and play something different you know what i mean and um, yeah. but yeah you're 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 100% right I, it's it's awesome to give dj's that creative freedom to play whatever they want you know what i mean and do whatever they want so it it's nice to see them you know take a risk like that for sure tell us something tell us something that people wouldn't know about these styles i mean I, i'm talking about like the the recesses of your adventures to the the elephant in the room that you very rarely rarely discuss like what is the what is a mm. d styles that no one would know about <laughs> um man uh, I th- <laughs> got him <laughs> um i think a lot of people don't know that i'm a i'm a i'm a really um i'm really into uh, ping pong table tennis and I love I love playing uh, ping pong, table tennis. Uh, love uh, that! I love that. Yeah. That is such a strategy game as well. <laughs> it is. It is. I, so I grew up. So it, like uh, I was born in the Philippines, and in the Philippines, that's such a huge sport, you know. Um, and then when we moved to the states, uh, we you know growing up, I was always around 
a ping pong table, yeah. you know, house parties, every, all my relatives would come over and we would just play and play. And, um, so I, you know, like my uncles, they were all super good. And so I, I was, as a young kid, I just always learned and, and played with people who were so good, you know what I mean? And so now in this day and age, it, it's, it's rare to even find a, a ping pong table. And, and it's, it's, it's tough to even find people who can actually play and not just smash it. You know what I mean? But actually yeah, know yeah. how to play. Right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's t- the last thing you want to do is you're batting that ball somewhere where you can't get it. It's hard enough to grab it as it bounces around. It's so light, dude. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. That's not the one. But, right. But just the art of of knowing how to spin that, you know what I mean, and cut it and the, the, the techniques of like, okay, if, if you're going to um, do an underspin, I have to hit it and do a top spin or else it's, it's going to counteract and the ball's not going to go the right direction, you know. Very interesting. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's the same sort of pattern. Mm. It's the same sort of what's the word? You 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 have to absorb yourself into getting every single outcome under your belt so that you're able to react to it in any situation. That is kind of like DJing, really, isn't it? <laughs> Right, right. Yeah, no, for sure. Hey, you know, I wanted to ask you, do you do you ever use um like a those like loopers, like a like a loop station type of thing? Um I did once, but I I kind of I kind of stopped from a beatbox point of view because I just felt like it took the magic out of the performance. Do you know what I mean? Mm, right, right, right. It's like it's like um you know, pulling the rabbit out of the hat, you know, that's the beatbox thing. But then if you've got like four rabbits sitting on the table anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotcha, yeah. Okay. Now, I, just because I know there's a whole like culture and community of of just that, you know what I mean? And guys who just do like loop stuff and, and kind of make that uh, their own art and stuff. I, I was just curious if you do that stuff too. No, but it is, again, and, and I think this harks back to your production values in the studio. Mm-hmm. A lot of DJs, or at least up until the newer generation mixers, et cetera, were really reluctant at taking advantage of those things. You weren't, because you had a, of a studio mentality. You had a, you had a, a different set of, uh, um, create, you had a different creative palette. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I just try to use it any advantage I had, you know what I mean? Just cause I wasn't, I wasn't this, this like crazy battle monster, you know what I mean? And so just so, you know, and, and, and I knew that I, I wasn't going to pursue that. Like I wasn't built for, for, for battling. Like that takes, that takes a different person. You have to have super thick skin and you have to be able to, to, to perform under pressure and I'm, I'm not that, I'm not that guy, you know what I mean? And I realized that early. So I was like, all right, let me just, let me just focus on what I know that I'm good at. And it's, it's more of studio stuff, making songs. Um, and let me apply this scratch stuff that I know to, you know, to what I've learned already. Cause I was making beats on the, the drum machines and the samplers mm-hmm. as well. And so I kind of applied that and I said, well, why do I need to program these drums, I can just scratch these drums. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Why do I need to? Why do I need to sample this loop? I can just loop it myself on the turntables, and it, to me, it sounds better because it's it has that that human quality, and it's not so quantized. You know what I mean? Yeah, I do, I do. And at this point, I just want to big up Z Trip because I think he 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 follows a very similar uh, ethic in in DJing and production as well, doesn't he? He's he's not afraid yes. to merge the two, and but yet still have the skills to shine. Right, right, right. Yeah, Dietrich definitely pioneer in that man. Like a real, um, has that punk rock mentality where he just doesn't care and he just he'll he'll try it. And if it sounds good, it sounds good. Shouldn't matter what what genre or what whatever the rules are. He's always he's always going outside the box. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, mm-hmm. production wise in the studio, what 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 uh, what setup what setup are you working on at the moment? Um, right now I'm using Ableton to record in. Mm-hmm. Um, but I use, you know, primarily just one turntable, one mixer, and I have this little loop loop station thing that I use, and it's just to to try out ideas on the fly. So you know, just to kind of get an idea of okay, th- these drums will work with this bass line or whatever. And then once I kind of know what I'm working with, 
then I'll take it to Ableton and record it clean, you know, in, in a cleaner uh, format, uh, and then be able to arrange it in in inside Ableton that way. Are you working with breaks? Is it or are, are these uh, really ready made samples? Or are you going through that stack of records behind you? I use I use vinyl, um, awesome. but if I only have one copy, then I'll, I'll have to digitize it just because I don't want to get the record burn and mess it up. Yeah. Um, so so then I'll digitize it and then I'll, I can mess with it in Serato and it, it'll never get messed up. You know what I mean? But um, yeah, I, I still collect records and I'm always digging for uh, obscure stuff. You know what I mean? What's the what's the what's the album that you could almost say definitively, or at least? just so that the audience can be steered to something of a, of a blueprint of yours. What would you say is the definitive that, that, that exercises your versatility um, at, 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 a, at a certain peak of, of your career uh, that you, you could say, oh, yeah, that I, that I definitely had that? Uh, I mean, for, for my own stuff, uh, I'm sure it's um, Phantasmagoria. And, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> you know, that, that was just during a time when um, there wasn't, there wasn't um, anything quite like it. Like Cuba did Wave Twisters. That's right, yeah. And he, he, did, he did some outer space uh, aliens, you know, type stuff. And I wanted to do more darker, evil, sinister stuff. And I was very influenced by like Portishead and that 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 trip hop era. Mm. And I wanted to do, do something like that with that sound, but just on the turntables, you know what I mean? And so um, I, w- I would say, yeah, that that album. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still... Uh, I'm still chasing it, man. It's, it kind of goes back to that high, like where I, I, yeah. I want to recreate something like that, you know. Get that. Yeah, high. the old, the other old ego. Keep going, I'm with you, brother. <laughs> I'm with you. You know what? When I when I think back to like that trip hop era, when I think of Wave tw- Twister, all of the everything that kind of came out of the the. Well, I just feel like every single every single album should have been from from its place of the turntable and actually your skills need to match the production value on the record mm-hmm. if you never always some people you can't fake the funk like like you're saying before you go and record something you're putting in a, a you know a, a, a loop station you know what i mean like that's you trying right. before you commit right 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 yeah and, and i think another thing Another issue that I, I deal with is that um, when I'm making music, <clears throat> I'm also thinking of the live ele- element where it's like, I don't want to make, I don't want to build this song so much that I can't perform it live as well because there's mm. so much instrumentation going on. So I'm always trying to think and strip things down and say, all right, so if we were to ever perform this thing, I could do it with four people, you know, four other turntablers. Mm. One guy will have the drums, one guy's on bass line, one guy has you know, the, the main sample and then one, one person is the soloist or whatever. So I'm always trying to um, imagine, okay, I want to perform this, this piece live. I need to keep it in its, its most uh, basic um, minimal um, instrumentation, you know, what I mean? mm-hmm. just the, mm-hmm. just the meat and potatoes of it. People can get a little bit too uh, excited about that alone isn't it if they if you if you shoot your load and get two techers or mm. two clever some things are just energy and i get i think that's where your expression comes through the most d is like you it just feels effortless and that's what's that's that's the meat and veg oh man thank you thank you i think that's the goal but uh, i i mean i yeah I, I think there's people who you know like you just look at them and they they can make it look easy, you know what I mean. I, I look at, I look at, um, you know, guys like DJ Babu, and he the way he he juggles, or yeah. he, he cuts, he makes he makes it look look easy. And uh, you know the same thing with like Qbert, mm. um, and and so that's I don't think we're thinking in the moment like that, but that that is the goal, you know what I mean, is to make it look easy. <laughs> yeah, thinking in the moment. It, yeah, totally. Like right. So the so the stabilizer's off and you're just doing it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think that's the beauty of scratch DJing as a whole, is that I guess it's like a good electric guitar guitarist riffing. It's like it's such a given nowadays that you hear a guitar doing a certain thing, but but very rare, especially nowadays, do you see someone actually going 
at head and executing it in front of you. Mm, yeah. Right. I mean, outside of beatboxing, what, where do you look for like influence and ideas from? Um, for me, turntablism still does that for me, but um, oh, okay. yeah, man, I think, I think genres are important. And I know that's relatable from a DJ point of view, but, you know, drum and bass has always been an influence for me. And and uh-huh. some of the sounds that they pull off there, that, that, in, that subtly influences and re, it feeds back into hip hop and feeds back into contemporary music, I find really interesting. Right, right. Definitely. Yeah, the rhythms that that drum and bass has is crazy, man. Technical and just just so polyrhythmic, you know. Crazy. From, yeah, I I, I'm, I would imagine as as a, as a selector and as a producer that that must have the genres and influencing your sound that that must be that must be a constant. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think Craze, when Craze pulled off like the, the unthinkable when all of a sudden he was able to transfer his DJ skills into drum and bass. That was a real moment as well, wasn't it? Yeah, man. I, I thought that was dope because I think, you know, he was always into that music, but <clears throat> he's able to merge um, the technical skills of battling, you know what I mean? Stuff that he he's done and and put it into his DJ sets, you know what I mean? And not disrupt the dance floor at the same time. That's such a, that's such a, a skill set to learn. I think a lot of turntablists have a hard time, um, you know, going from the stage of battling and then going into a club uh, scenario and DJing and, and forgetting that, you know, people are either dancing or bobbing their heads and, and you, you don't want to disrupt that, you know what I mean, with your, your DJ set. Mm-hmm. That's effortless, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And I guess from a from a school's point of view, this is something of a of a constant as well. Just forever reiterating that style is your own. Be patient. Tr- take risks. Transfer skills across production and DJing, and just look deep enough into yourself to find who you are in the tapestry. Right. Right. One hundred percent. I, you know the journey is is never ending, and I think you're always trying to um, find yourself. You know, and and as we mature, our 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 tastes change. You know what I mean? And uh, you got to kind of take what you like and and uh, make it your own. You know what I mean? Constantly. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Did, was there was there ever a moment where you thought to yourself, "Oh man, I'd, I don't know if I can." I'm not sure if this is work. Something ain't connecting anymore. Did you ever, ever have those doubts? I did actually. Um, And um, it was after I put out Phantasmagoria. This is around 2000, um, 2003, 2004. Mm, um, And um, it's, um, you know, like I just had got married, had my first daughter, and um it it was during so yeah this is around 2005 i would say um i was putting out a lot of break records scratch records battle records mm-hmm. and that era it started to slow down and that's when serato kind of came in and yeah. people were buying less less vinyl and so it was harder for me to to make a living and pay bills by just putting out product mm-hmm. and at that at that moment i was like all right i need to make a decision do i what do i do here how do i pay my bills mm. do i do i go back to school or do i you know get a, a full-time nine to five job um so it was that around that time is when when i found found things to be difficult in um surviving off just my music full-time you mm. know what i mean um and uh, i was lucky enough that i had a, a good friend from japan he ended up moving to la and we started a business together where we were doing distribution of records um, and just what focusing on, on DJ accessories. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, so I still had my, my hand in, in DJing, but I didn't have to survive off of that full time. I had a side business where I could actually 
make some money, still in DJing, but off of DJ accessories. Man, that is super smart. And I think I think all of us have the any anyone that's worth their their salt in in um in the culture, you just find a way, don't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to. It's either that or or you crumble up and and stop, you know what I mean? And I didn't want to stop because this is all I know. And, that shit um, scares me, man. Can you imagine no D <laughs> styles? Can you imagine what it'd be like if we did not do those maneuvers to allow for us to even be sitting here now? That scares me, man. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and, and you know, I didn't want it to be where I had to put out some bullshit music just to make money. You know what I mean? I, yeah. I, I truly believe I'm, I want to put out something when I have something to say and it's worth, worth someone's time to listen to it you know what i mean mm-hmm. so what's so, the yeah. future what's the future superstar what's the future for d stars <laughs> um so i have another um turntable band group um it's called 545 it's myself <laughs> private peep show uh mike boo and dj xs so there's four of us um and uh, we basically do turntable music we're, we're still trying to carry the torch um in that art and we we put out music. So we just uh, recorded in Hawaii a couple months ago. We recorded some new music. Uh, so hopefully that out soon. And um, I, I got back into um, producing, making beats and working with MCs again. I, I stopped for a long time. Uh, in the in the late 90s, I was in a group called Third Sight and uh, I was doing all the beats and the scratches. And then I stopped when I when I got more into, um, you know, just turntablism. Mm-hmm. But, uh, I kind of fell fell in love with it again, and just the whole Renaissance era of of, of hip hop and indie hip hop. Mm-hmm. Um, so I got another record coming out soon, uh, next month, uh, with an MC, uh, Noah the Flood, and um, we Wicked. got a yeah we we got an album coming out. So I'm excited for that as well. Wow, that's awesome! I love that. Five oh five, huh? Yeah, yeah. So five four five. Um, five four five. That's it. That. That's um, five songs uh, by four turntablists um, in five days. Basically, we we we, we gave ourselves this <laughs> sort awesome. of uh, this goal. You know what I mean? So that's where the name comes from. Yo, that is the sickest idea. That is so <laughs> sick. What a concept! What a concept project! I love that. Yeah, thank you, man. You know, because we just don't want to overthink things and and be so like such a perfectionist. You know, like sometimes you can capture something. In, in five minutes and it, that's just that's it right there you know what I mean? you don't have to dress it up and spray cologne on it and, and paint it you know with this gloss it, like keep it raw and, and and as long as that that energy and that that feel is there then that's it put it i'd out, argue you know? i'd argue 545 is a brand as much as versus is bro that that oh shit <laughs> that concept is that's dope. crazy I never thought about that. That's dope, though. Yeah, yeah you could have like beatbox five four fives. You could have producer five four. Dude, this the... <laughs> copyright D Let's style twenty twenty two. I love it. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I'm saying. That's that's the lick. Wow. I never thought about that. Yeah. Oh, thank you, man. Yeah, man. Hey, have that one on me, man. Success is, you know, that's it. you. You you're building and you're creating, brother. More, more power to you. Thank you, man. Trying. Trying, ladies and gentlemen, Killer Cannon <laughs> Podcast, Mr. 545, Visible Scratch Pickles, <laughs> Beat Junkies, the awesome D Styles inside the place. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us, my brother. Thank you, man. I really appreciate you uh, having me, man. It's an honor, big time. Oh, uh, brother, honestly, the pleasure is all mine and ours, and the rest of the crew <laughs> here. We uh, value you entirely and uh, looking forward to getting you over these shores eventually. Or at least me coming over there and we can buck and have a uh, uh, have a cup of have a cup of tea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, hey, seriously, if you ever if you ever in Las Vegas, let me know. Man. Oh, one hundred percent. I'll be I'll be in the um the what's it called? The oh, I don't remember Mandalay Bay. I'll be there in the Oh <laughs> shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mandalay Bay. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a good time to me though. Shit. Yeah, yeah, man. Vegas, Vegas is everything, man. I love it. I'll happily be over ASAP, my brother. Let me know anytime, bro. Seriously. My guy. 
Ladies and gentlemen, D Styles in the house, Killer Killer Podcast, out like it was out of fashion. You know what to do, sharing is caring, tell a friend to tell a friend. Cheers, D. Thank you, Killer. Appreciate you, man. Take care, brother. Peace.